Hey everyone, today we're diving into the wonderful world of Rust. Yes, you heard it right, Rust, the language that's taking over systems programming, web development, blockchain, and of course, our hearts. Now, Rust has this reputation for being strict, but incredibly powerful, and by the end of this video, I hope you'll feel way more comfortable with its syntax. We'll go through some basic examples, throw in some memes, and hopefully it all makes sense by the end. Let's go! Alright, let's start with the basics, variables and types. Now, Rust is pretty unique here. Unlike languages like Python or JavaScript, variables in Rust are immutable by default. Yup, you heard it right. They can change unless you specifically say they can. This might seem weird at first, but there is a reason for it. When you make a variable immutable, you are telling Rust hey, I'm not gonna touch this value again. That allows Rust to optimize things behind the scenes, but if you really want to change it, just add the mute keyword. See that? Let x equal 5 creates an immutable variable, and if you try to change x, Rust will actually stop you. But when you add mute, it's game on, and you can update Y without any issues. Now, let's talk about types. Rust has this great type inference system, which is a fancy way of saying Rust usually knows what type you are using without you telling it. But sometimes, Rust like, uh, I need a bit more info here. For example, if you want to be clear that a variable is a specific type, you can add a type annotation. This can be especially helpful if you're working with numbers and need to be precise. So here, we are explicitly saying Z is an i32, which is a 32-bit integer. Rust type system is part of what makes it so reliable. So the more comfortable you are with it, the smoother your Rust journey will be. All right, let's move on to functions. Rust functions look familiar if you have used other languages, but Rust does things a bit differently. First off, there is no return keyword. In Rust, the last line of your function is the return value if there is no semicolon. Sounds weird, right? But it actually makes functions more readable once you get the hang of it. Let's check out a simple function that adds two numbers. In this example, add takes two integers and returns their sum. No need to write a return. Rust knows that the last line is what you want to send back. It feels cleaner and, I'll say, kinda elegant. Now it's time for the big leaks, ownership and borrowing. This is the part where Rust really stands out from other languages. Ownership is Rust's way of managing memory safely, without a garbage collector, but it can feel a bit strict at first. In Rust, every value has an owner. When that owner goes out of scope, the values get dropped. And if you try to use it afterward, Rust's gonna stop you. So how S1 loses its ownership once S2 takes over? If you try to use S1 after this point, Rust will throw an error, because it's no longer in charge. It's like Rust is saying, mm, that's not yours anymore. But what if you want to use a value without taking ownership? That's where borrowing comes in. Think of it like lending a book to a friend. You still own that book, but they can read it for a while. In Rust, you borrow values using references, which looks like this. Here, ampersand S1 is a reference to S1, meaning we are borrowing it in calculate length without taking ownership. Once the function is done, S1 is still ours to use. Pretty neat right? Now, lifetimes. This is Rust's way of making sure borrowed data doesn't outlive the owner. It's a little advanced, but understanding the basics will save you from some head-scratching moments. Let's look at an example function that uses lifetimes to keep things in check. So here, tick A is a lifetime parameter. It's Rust's way of ensuring that the references X and Y stick around as long as the return value needs them. This prevents us from accidentally returning a reference to something that no longer exists. Pattern matching is where Rust really shines. If you're used to switch statements, think of match as a switch on steroids. It's powerful and super flexible. Let's look at a simple match statement. This lets you check a value against multiple patterns in one go. And if none match, we've got underscore as a catch-all pattern. Super handy for making your code clear. Just don't overuse it. Finally, error handling. Rust doesn't have exceptions. It uses result and option types. At first, this 
might seem a bit clunky, but it forces you to handle errors properly. Here's an example function that divides two numbers but returns an error if you try to divide by zero. Instead of crashing, Rust makes sure you handle both success and failure cases, which makes your code more resilient. And that's a wrap on Rust syntax essentials. We've covered a lot, but there's always more to learn. If this video helped clarify things, hit that like button and subscribe for more Rust content. Thanks for watching and happy coding!